The tunnel you are seeing is not an ordinary tunnel, but rather, it is literally the world's largest tunnel passing under the sea. Constructed 250 feet below the sea's bottom, this 50-kilometer-long tunnel is a mega-project that engineers call the seventh wonder of the world. The biggest reason for this is its construction. 13,000 workers working together in extremely difficult conditions and excavating in an area where the entire weight of the ocean rests above. A single small mistake can fill this tunnel with water, burying both humans and machines forever. And that too, in just a few seconds. About 13,000 years ago, when the last ice age was ending, it separated today's England and Europe from each other. The reason for their separation became this part of the sea, which is now known as the English Channel. Although this channel is quite wide, at this point it becomes quite narrow. And here, England and France are only 33 kilometers apart. Throughout history, there have been many attempts to eliminate this separation, but these experiments were stopped after causing many deaths, perhaps because technology was very limited at that time. However, at the end of the 20th century, when technology was advancing towards its peak, once again, the idea of connecting England and France with a terrestrial link was considered. This was the era of the 1980s, when even the biggest machinery could be built. Apart from the machine, there was another challenge, and that was convincing England. Yes, the cold waters of the English Channel have always given England an upper hand against enemies. From Napoleon to Hitler, many of England's enemies had plans to conquer it but it was the harsh conditions of the English Channel that always tipped the balance in favor of England. During World War II, Adolf Hitler had launched a secret project to dig an underwater tunnel from the French village of Calais, aiming to gain control over England. However, this project never actually commenced. Following Hitler's death and the end of World War II, Europe began to undergo significant changes, with business booming and prosperity spreading. France and England, once enemies, started trading via the English Channel. As time passed, in 1986, the two nations decided to overcome this barrier and connect England to mainland Europe. In England, this decision faced protests, as many people were proud of England's island status. After months of lengthy discussions, both countries finally agreed to build an undersea tunnel. This was named the Channel Tunnel, often referred to as the Euro Tunnel. The agreement stipulated that teams from England and France would dig from their respective sides, meeting at a central point. Before its commencement, the project seemed like a colossal failure to many. Constructing a tunnel nearly 38 kilometers long under the sea was not a task any single engineering firm would dare undertake. Eventually, it was decided that 10 engineering firms would collaborate to construct this project. Before designing the Channel Tunnel, it was essential to determine what kind of transport would operate within it. Where would it start? And where would it end? It was mutually agreed that a total of three tunnels would be constructed. Between England and France, there would be a railway loop. One terminal would be located in the city of Calais in France, while the other terminal would be in Folkestone in England. The total length of the tunnel would be 56 kilometers, of which the part under the sea would be 38.6 kilometers long. In 1986, construction of the Channel Tunnel finally began. The biggest challenge faced by the engineering team was the Tunnel Boring Machine, TBM. Since no project of this kind had ever been undertaken before, a TBM of the required diameter was not available. The TBM machine had to be built from scratch. Thousands of miles away in Seattle, Washington, the Robbins Company, known for their expertise in making boring machines, was tasked with building this specialized tunneling machine. Once completed, this TBM would be 800 feet long and weigh 1,500 tons. It would have a diameter of 50 feet, with several hundred sharp tungsten carbide blades at the front. The machine would be propelled forward by hydraulic legs. A conveyor belt inside the machine would remove the debris, carrying it to a service train, which would then transport it out of the tunnel. This machine was a marvel in itself. Compared to the old technique of blasting tunnels through mountains, this machine was a significant boon for the developers. However, this new technology also brought many dangers. If water leaked during boring under the sea, even 250 feet below the seabed, 
the pressure could be so great that it could engulf both humans and the machine in seconds. Surveys revealed that beneath the sea on the England side, there was a layer of chalk that could prevent water leakage into the tunnel. However, the seabed on the French side had many cracks where the TBM could not operate. Therefore, a decision was made to build a new type of TBM that would also function as a submarine. This machine would be able to withstand as much pressure as a World War II submarine. When the machine was ready, it brought a new challenge. How to transport it 200 feet below the ground. The machine was disassembled and each piece was separately transported underground. Reassembling it underground took several months and cost millions of dollars. Two years had passed since the project started. And finally, in 1988, excavation began on both sides. Disposing of the vast quantities of soil and rock debris was a huge task in itself. The machine was cutting through 750 square feet of rock per day, and in just one hour, it accumulated as much as 2,400 tons of debris. On the English side, this debris was dumped between Folkestone and Dover, beneath Shakespeare Cliff, creating the Samphire Ho Country Park. On the French side, the debris, which was in the form of sludge, was dumped near Sangadi in the Fond Pigyan Valley, creating an artificial lake. While a significant amount of debris was being removed from the tunnels, there was also a considerable amount of material that needed to be brought in. As the TBM bored through, it was crucial to seal the layers of loose rock and chalk at the same pace. This was necessary, because if the seawater above found a way into the tunnel, stopping it would be impossible. For this purpose, circular concrete slabs, matching the size of the tunnel, were being fitted. This concrete was even stronger than that used in nuclear plants. Made from reinforced steel, about 750,000 concrete slabs were used in the channel tunnel. The weight of a complete ring of these slabs was equivalent to 40 tons, meaning the total concrete used was enough to build eight structures the size of the Burj Khalifa. These slabs were transported to the tunnel on service trains where a special machine fitted them into place. Weeks passed, then months, and the tunnels on both sides were gradually approaching each other. Everyone was eagerly waiting for the moment when the two tunnels would finally meet. However, this task, as simple as it may seem in theory, was quite complicated in practice. If the two TBMs did not advance in the correct positions, the tunnels under the sea would never meet. To solve this problem, a laser beam guidance system was employed. One laser was installed in the English machine and another in the French machine, with both guidance systems interconnected. Whenever a machine changed its position, the guidance system sent a signal to the computer, which then adjusted the position of the boring machine's head using hydraulic jacks. To confirm whether the guidance system was working correctly, the last 100 meters were crucial. Both machines would be stopped, and a steel rod would be sent from one side to the other to confirm the accuracy of the tunnel alignment. After three years of continuous boring, the moment finally arrived when only 100 meters remained between the two tunnels. As planned, a steel rod was sent through, and the alignment of both tunnels was found to be nearly perfect, with only a 10-inch difference, which was within the acceptable limit. Now came the most challenging and unusual part for the engineering team one of the TBMs had to be sacrificed. Yes, sacrificed. This was necessary because the tunnels were lined with two foot thick concrete slabs, reducing their diameter from 50 feet to 46 feet. Since the diameter of the TBM was 50 feet, it could not be retrieved through the now narrower tunnel. The solution was to remove one of the machines from the path, a process engineers refer to as a mechanical suicide. The decision was made to sacrifice the English TBM. Its angle was changed to direct it downwards into the earth, and after descending several hundred feet, it was left buried there. To this day, it remains entombed underground. For the first time in 13,000 years, a land connection between the two countries was about to be re-established. For this event, workers from both countries were chosen, one from each. They manually broke the last chalk wall using jackhammers and exchanged flags in a media event. After being separated thousands of years ago due to glaciers, England and France were finally reconnected. This was truly a remarkable feat. To celebrate, a festival was held. Years of hard work and dedication had finally paid off. After completing the finishing work, 
the Channel Tunnel was officially opened on 6 May 1994. If the cost of the project is adjusted to today's currency value, it amounts to 12 billion pounds. At the peak of construction, the Channel Tunnel employed about 13,000 workers. Unfortunately, 10 workers lost their lives during the course of the project. The entire project comprises three tunnels, two for trains and one smaller tunnel designated for emergency use. Today, approximately 60,000 passengers use the tunnel daily, including the transportation of 4,600 trucks, 140 coaches, and 7,300 cars, which are carried through the tunnel on cargo trains.